Smiling Cats, Jamberwalks, and Blondes on Shrooms meet Tin Men, Yellow Roads, and Wizards Hiding in Rooms. And finally, Super Animals decide not to stay in their lane as we delve into a literary short box of the inane. the short box of the inane. Your trash receptacle for those comics so out there, so abstract, so strange, that no other show can probably give them the dignity and analysis they deserve. Along with a bunch of bad puns and dumb jokes. I'm your host, the last angry ghoulie, the great and terrible. Although many have suggested I just leave the first part of that description off my business cards. But now my friends, the time has come to talk of many things, of ships and shoes and ceiling wax, of cabbages and kings. Or we could just talk about Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew. Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew were created by comic book legend Roy Thomas and artist Scott Shaw. The characters are introduced in an insert story in New Teen Titans number 16 in 1982, where on Earth Sea anthropomorphized animals walk the earth and humans are just a legend. The book relied heavily on punny versions of real life names such as cities like New York City, that's new with a G like the animal, and the crew consisted of Captain Carrot, with powers similar to Superman, Alley Cat Abra, who wields a magic Wanda, Yankee Poodle, with her powers to attract and repel, Rubber Duck, who could stretch and shape his body, Pig Iron, the metallic, super-strong swine, and Fastback. He's a turtle, but don't let that fool you, he's very fast. The crew was later joined by Little Cheese, who had the ability to shrink to the size of a mouse. Huh. The title lasted 20 issues, but when the book was cancelled, there were still six issues in production. Those six issues were then condensed into three double-sized issues where the heroes traveled into the public domain kingdoms of Oz and Wonderland, a miniseries that would be titled The Oz-Wonderland War. So, a bunch of anthropomorphic animals have to stop two fictional literary kingdoms from destroying one another. Makes sense to me. Tonight we'll check out the first issue. Why not all three? Because this is a lot of story to go over, and I need to hit that Halloween deadline. Written by E. Nelson Bridwell, Joey Cavallari, and Carol Lay, with art by Carol Lay, this is the Oz Wonderland War, Issue 1. In the Z building, hard at work on another issue of Wonder Wabbit, Rodney, <coughs> Rodney Rabbit, comic book artist, senses he's being watched. First a smile, then a Cheshire Cat appears around it. He's here for help, although by the looks of things, they're all mad here. It explains that Oz has been conquered by Roquat, the Gnome King, who's turned Queen Ozma and her allies into objects. If he's not stopped, he'll eventually find a passage into Wonderland and conquer it as well. Ronnie grabs a magic carrot, runs into the closet, but then comes out as a superhero. Captain Carrot! He puts out an alert to the zoo crew to come to the rest, and right on cue, they've arrived. They discuss how to get there via magic or rabbit holes, but perhaps a trip through a looking glass is best. The Cheshire Cat chants a brief poem and jumps into the mirror, followed by the zoo crew and their hilarious puns. They're now in a literal reverse reality with even their hearts on the other sides of their chest. Well, here I am through the looking glass. Man, things are weird here. When you're in a strange place, you should never take anything for granted. Hey, a free cup! It says, drink me. You're the boss, cup. Hmm, it's nutty. Odd, I don't seem to be shrinking. Oh, one moment. Oh, thank God. Okay, all is as it should be. I guess some things just can't get any smaller. Here they find the residents of Wonderland, including the Red Queen, Tweedledee and Dumb, not the Batman villains, but their literary inspirations, and many more. They all run super fast, but don't actually move anywhere, except Fastback, who actually can run super fast. He has to then return to his party, before they head through another mirror into Oz. Fastback remarks that it looks pretty different from the movies, but the cat reminds him this is a literary work. The Cabal makes contact with two Ozians, H.M. Wogglebug and the Hungry Tiger. Wogglebug has prepared a lecture explaining the situation. Roquat captured the leader of the Flying Monkeys, and using the magic cap got three wishes from the monkeys. Using his first two wishes, he had the monkeys steal a magical belt that increased his own magic power, and then the monkeys transported the gnomes across the Deadly Desert and into Oz proper, which was unable to repel their invasion spared the people of Oz, their leaders, the Scarecrow, Lion, 
Ozma, and the rest were turned into glittery objects and scattered across Oz. Unfortunately, they've discovered that whatever region those leaders are hidden in, the objects they've become are the most common color in that region. Wacko Bug proposes they find the missing leaders, restore them, and drive out the Gnome King. Captain Carrot, the zoo crew, and the rest will begin the search for the magical objects in Gillikin Country, which is under attack by giant animals from the land of Mo. And right now, we're very fortunate to be joined by a representative of the land of Mo, head advisor to the Raja of Kanasi, the Jinn of Rummy, Mr. M. Harry Howard. Hiya, pal! Are you talking to me, Chowderhead? Why, I haven't been called pal in years. I lost my one friend when he ran off with my wife. I trailed them to Pittsburgh, Miami, Dallas, New Orleans. Finally, I confronted them at Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls! Slowly I turned, step by step, inch by inch. I walked up to him and I smashed him. Ooh. I hit him. Ooh. I walloped him. Ooh. And I smashed him to pieces. <laughs> so all that happened because you went to Niagara Falls. Oh, blood. <laughs> Niagara Falls! Slowly I turned. No, please, I already have two black eyes. A purple-winged dragon is chasing citizens until a unicorn-headed man gives him a rectal poking and then runs away, getting the dragon to chase him out of the town. While the hungry tiger and a not-cowardly lion, Lion, try and wrangle the multi-faced shelled creature called a Gigaboo. That said, all three wind up between a rock-like creature and a hard-faced dragon, but Alley Cat Abra levitates the trio away from the monsters at the last moment. Pig Iron and Yankee Poodle stun the monsters while Fastback trips them up. Once the dragon gets entangled in the Gigaboo's pincers, it's over, as they never settled on an escape clause. <laughs> Look, comic book, I do the lame puns of this show, okay? Keep it up and you'll find yourself on a one-way trip to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls! <laughs> Captain Carrot does some quick mental gymnastics. Two monsters from Mo equals two O's because reasons. Two O's in the name reads as Moo. The cow, Erdly Lion, is missing and cows say Moo. They find a purple statue of a cow and sure enough it transforms into the Cowardly Lion. Of course he's too scared to get down from his pedestal, but wait man, what's that groovy smell? Captain Carrot realizes they're in a field of catnip and all the cats on the team are real mellow, man. Maybe later they can put on some funk music and just be chill, daddy-o. That's what hippies sound like, right? With the case of the munchies, the hungry tiger pounces on a proud pig iron only to learn the iron part of his name is more than a bit too literal to digest. The Cheshire Cat also takes an unhealthy interest in Little Cheese, but Fastback takes him for a spin. Captain Care tries to get Allie to come down, figuratively and literally, but she always thought he might be cuter with short ears. She offers him FWB status. Friends with buds. Finally, Rubber Duck rounds the cats up by taking the form of a ball of string as Pig Iron sees Allie and Carrot up in the clouds and figure things up there will just have to run their course. Oh, look! Two superheroes! Why, they're getting very affectionate. What a day to be caught without an umbrella. That's right, baby. Captain Carrot's pitching some of his best woo en français. But once the air clears, well, the air is cleared. There are some feelings they never acted upon, but for now, what happens on a cloud stays on a cloud. Using her magic wanda, Allie takes them home, and it's a hero's welcome for the Cowardly Lion, but his return is observed by the Gnome King. Issue 2, oh, I mean, the second half of Issue 1, opens with Pig Iron failing at Flamingo Croquet. The Queen of Hearts is not having it, and it's oof with his head! Kira tries to defuse the situation, but Pig Iron doesn't need anyone to protect him. The heroes start arguing until Ali Cat Abra defuses the tension. Meanwhile, an ambassador from Oz has arrived. Dorothy Gale, formerly of Kansas. Her fashion sense makes that abundantly clear to the catty dog, Yankee Poodle. Soon, however, the Red Queen and the Queen of Hearts get into a shouting match until Yankee Poodle uses her attraction powers to pull a hedgehog into the pole for a winning shot to end the game. Next, General Ginger arrives. She has a spy in the Gnome King's court, Jellia Jam, the royal attendant of the Emerald City. Through her, they've learned that Roquat has a magic picture frame that he's using to spy on the Wonderland Oz Rebels, but he can't hear them. Jellia has a shortwave radio, a souvenir left behind by the Wizard of Oz that lets her communicate with Ginger. She's learned that the Scarecrow's trinket is in Munchkinland, a primarily blue-colored kingdom. Let me just 
Ira say that I, for one, know how important Munchkin Land is to the upcoming primary election for Wizard of the Land of Oz. As goes Munchkin Land, so goes the election. Ick being I Munchkin Lander. Also, I hear, uh, plan on reaching to Texas to pay reparations to the talking trees for Hobsted apples. <laughs> Clues point to the color red being important to find the scarecrow. Dorothy remembers traveling through Munchkin Land and encountering a field of red puppies. Heading out this time, the crew is joined by the Mad Hatter, again, not the Batman villain, Tweedledee and Dumb, Griffin, Cowardly Lion, Hungry Tiger, and the Mock Turtle. Everyone got that? Arriving in Oz, the scenery is a bit generic, but fortunately Dorothy knows how to navigate the yellow brick road and they find the poppies. But the field is guarded by two Kalidas, bare tiger things. Surprisingly, it's the Cowardly Lion and Hungry Tiger who pounce the first monster. Then the Mock Turtle delivers a spin kick before the Griffin airlifts him out. Finally, Pig Iron and Captain Carrot make short work of the feral beast before Pig Iron and Rubber Duck manage to slingshot the monsters away. Carrot flies over the poppies, avoiding a second drug trip and using his super rabbity eyesight to spot numerous small blue figurines under the canopy of red flowers. But like Icarus, Captain Carrot swooped too low and inhaled the deadly poppy spores. I don't know Greek mythology. Fastback runs in to get him, but also falls victim to the vegetative snooze button. Rubber Duck is next until finally Yankee Doodle uses her powers to drag the heroes out of the field. Dorothy whistles for help, and Little Cheese laments that shrinking down to the size of a mouse isn't much help in a monster battle, but Dorothy points out he can skirt under the flowers and avoid the fumes better. Also, Dorothy's whistle has summoned the Queen of the Mice and its love at first squeak. Little Cheese and the Mouse Queen's royal guard head in to find more figurines. Unfortunately, the Queen falls asleep thanks to the poppies. Little Cheese tries to rescue her, but feels himself about to go under. He grows to large size just in time for Yankee to pull him and the Queen out. The Mouse Guard has found seven figurines. Alice remembers a poem about Tweedledee and Dom being scared by a crow. The mice bring the Tweedle, whichever statue out, and Allie casts a spell. It's the Scarecrow! Again, not the Batman villain. Sadly, the Mouse Queen knows it would never work out, as she and Cheese are literally from different worlds, but she plants a peck on the hero before he leaves. Roquan is furious. This is Dorothy's fault. But the next time they go looking for one of the missing Ozians... They'll be doomed! Oof. Okay, that was a bit of a slog. 46 plus pages and featuring characters from three different properties. But did it make you long for home, or did you realize we're all a little mad here? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, let's take a closer look at issue one of Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew in the Oz Wonderland War. The humor of the zoo crew is pretty much kept at the puns are funny level throughout the series, and frankly, that's a step beneath the humor of the two books. Alice in Wonderland especially was rife with social commentary and absurdist imagery, and while younger readers might not mind the constant puns, to an older reader like myself having a double-sized issue meant it just kind of went on and on and on. I was not a fan of the humor. As for the plot, how is this a war? I mean, there's a war going on in Oz, just like in the 1985 film Return to Oz, where the Gnome King is turning heroes into tchotchkes and taking over Oz. But the Wonderland characters have no real good motivation for coming to Oz's rescue, other than a stated half-hearted self-motivation. Preemptive strike lest the Gnome King come after them. I'm not sure if it's shrewd and preemptive, or just a weak framing device to get the two kingdoms together. At least the heroes are better motivated. People need their help. That's literally the only motivation you need to get superheroes involved in a story. And there were a few interpersonal moments among the crew I liked, the friction between Carrot and Pig Iron, and the Cadabra's blossoming romance with the Captain, whereas there wasn't much character development with the Ozians or Wonderlanders. Maybe the writers didn't feel they could do much with these characters since their development is handled in the outside books that they're drawing on for inspiration. They're essentially just there for the zoo crew to react to, or to react to the zoo crew. Credit to the art by Carol Lay. She's not Scott Shaw, but she does maintain his quasi-animated style for the zoo crew throughout the book while managing to draw the Oz and Wonderland cast in a style very similar to the illustrations by John R. Neal, who illustrated L. Frank Baum's books, and John Tenniel, who illustrated Lewis Carroll's novels. They look like literary illustrations. I think the thing probably most hurting the story is that none of the three properties are particularly well known. Let me explain. Certainly the zoo crew has its fans, but honestly... There's a big difference in audience size with Captain Carrot and, say, a book starring the Justice League. Also, I think most people are more familiar with The Wizard of Oz 1939 MGM film and the 1951 Disney Alice in Wonderland cartoon. Really, how many people knew who the Hungry Tiger or Wogglebog was? Honestly, the Wonderland characters are almost an afterthought. This is primarily an Oz book with Oz characters. 
Wonderland may have just been added on so you could say the Oz Wonderland War in the title and get people curious about how these two properties are going to mesh. Well, there you have it. It's a mess. A competent, well-intentioned mess, but a mess nonetheless. I give Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew in the Oz Wonderland War issue number one, two out of five stars. And although we know the Emerald City is at one end of the Yellow Brick Road, at the other, you'll find the next episode of the Shark Box of the Inane, in which we'll... In which we'll... In which we'll once again have to see who's at the door. Please follow me off camera. Join me as I head onto a property I no longer own. Mr. Oh. Gooley, as a fellow top hat wearer, I encourage you to fight this stereotype that everyone wearing a top hat is a lunatic. Well, that's a good point, I suppose. I and... regularly see a psychiatrist, and he tells me I'm fine, except for one thing. Oh, what's that? I think I'm a teepee. No? I think I'm a wigwam. No? I'm a teepee. No! I'm a wigwam! Uh, uh, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did your therapist recommend you do about this? He recommended I drink some tea and relax with friends, maybe socialize. I don't get it. How will a tea party stop you from thinking you're a teepee? Or a wigwam. Or a wigwam. If I have a tea party, I can relax. Then I won't be too tense. Oh, no. No. <laughs> See? Wigwam, teepee, too tense. I'd like to apologize to all Native Americans who had to hear that joke. Uh, I'd also like to apologize to all Italians who heard that joke. Um, if you're French and heard that joke, I'm sorry. In fact, I want to apologize to everyone who heard that joke. Thank you for joining me, everyone. If I yell out, change places, can I go live in your house and you can come here and host this show? It takes guts. I mean, courage. Put them up. Put them up. I probably better put them up because I usually have to fight my way out of this studio after every episode. Too tense. <laughs> Good night, everyone. I'll see you back next time for another episode of the Short Box of the Inane. I don't know if the jokes will be that high quality, but you know, I'll be here.